Okay, so welcome everyone to today's AI Talks. Um, so today we are very happy to host Jiafei Duan. Jiafei is currently a second year PhD student at a Robotics and State Estimation Lab, University of Washington. Um, his supervisor is Dieter Fox and Rajan Krishna. And his research interest is in um, robot learning, embodied AI, and computer vision. Um, and he also received um, Singapore's prestigious National Science PhD scholarship for his PhD study. So yeah, very happy to host um, Jafei. And now let's start your talk and we need to listen. Yeah, thanks, Tiangai, for the introduction. So uh, hi, everyone. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. Yeah, so today I'll be giving a talk uh, on some of our recent work that helps to build towards, you know, the attempt to democratize robot learning for all. And I think I mentioned, uh, I'm advised by Dita Fox and Ranjay Krishnan. So I think to just like sort of get, uh, sort of like, hey, start, uh, get start of the topic. I think there has been a lot of emergence in foundation models over the years, you know, especially in various domains. We have like DALI2, we have co-pilots, we have, you know, something that we are well familiar, ChatGPT. And for those people that works on Embody AI, actually Procton is one of the huge uh, model that's able to help with object navigation and body AI. And, you know, even with like text to 3D, uh, you know, alpha geometry and even recent video generation stuff. I guess everyone is familiar with Sora by now. So the question that still remains unclear to us is what is that foundational model in robotics? So that's something that we want to ask. And more specifically, what is that foundational model for robotic manipulation? And that's also a question that I would want to ask. So what should such you know, foundation model in robotics looks like? So I think back in the days, people has already been working extensively on manipulation, uh, either be trying using traditional methods like post estimation, uh, you know, using uh, time based methods to uh, sort of predict, uh, to generate, you know, task and motion planning in terms of manipulation. But somehow that has transfer, uh, transformed over the years because, you know, we don't really live on a tabletop setting. You know, this is in the real world, it looks something more like the picture in the center. But if you really talk about real world, I think this is what a real world context should look like. And that is why you want your household robot to be able to, you know, perform general purpose manipulation in such cluster environment and, you know, to manipulate on really personalized objects that it matters to you. And that is where what foundation model in robotics should look like. A general, a general purpose robot system that's able to do that. So to summarize what I just said, I think a foundation model in robotics should have in-context learning. It should also obey scaling law, like what we see in computer vision and NLP. And it should also be able to generalize to new environment and not only you know, adapted to the training distribution that it has been trained on, but it's able to you know, adapt to new uh, variations of the environment changes, such as lighting, camera position, and, and everything else. And of course, we want it to be homogeneous. And that's something that's really important for building such foundation model in robotics. And the ingredient of building foundation model robotics, people have sort of you know, come to a conclusion or a general sentiment about it. And if you look at the recent survey, a lot of this work actually summarized down to having a bunch of robot data. And this data I'm referring to like multi-model data that has you know, text, vision, and also the trajectory of the robot itself. And then you train an imitation learning policy. Basically, for those that's new, imitation learning policy is a policy that's able to you know, mimic the action that the robot is taking uh, by just learning in a supervised manner. And then think of it like now we are doing this with cross embodiment and deploying that into the real world. So you need a lot of data, train a really good imitation learning policy and deploy that into the real world. And of course, if you want to have such foundation model, the data should be at a scale equivalent to some of the vision and language data that's out there. And that's one of the main bottleneck that I'll come to. So even though we already have, you know, a lot of really good multitask transformers, you know, large scale robotics models that's out there. But the main problem is that, first of all, the first problem is that it's not really able to generalize and at least People have not really dived deep into studying generalization for some of you know, these kind of transformers in robotics and before they try to scale it up. So that's one of the first problem. And the second problem is data and more specifically robot data. So if you take a 
axis and you try to draw the ease of scaling versus generalization, and you put all the modern transformers robotics paper out there, the question is, can we really can we find a good line to actually divide some of these models and help people that wants to scale up foundation model in robotics to make better decision choice? So the question that my work tries to answer is that, first of all, how can we evaluate existing behavior cloning, which is imitation learning models, before we try to scale them up with a bunch of robot data? And can we really democratize robot data collection process and make it in a way that is similar to how people collect uh, data for language and vision? So with that, I'll introduce our first work, the Colloquium, which is a benchmark for evaluating generalization for robotic manipulation. And uh, this work is currently under submission. And before we go in, you know, so there is this guy from Twitter. I'm not sure anyone, like how many of you actually know this guy, but he's a really famous guy, works in open AI, and he's one of the person of the sequence to sequence based model and a bunch of really awesome papers. So he has this tweet that shows that, you know, creating good benchmark and data set is critical in advancing, you know, progress in AI. So you can look at it from like ImageNet, the wild data set, you know, even Glue and in NLP. So there is a bunch of this kind of data set in computer vision and language. Uh, however, there is not really so much of benchmarking in robotics, or at least there's not really much standardization benchmarking in robotics for manipulation, especially now in the era whereby we try to scale up some of these robotic transformers. So with that, we want to attempt to actually benchmark generalization for robotic manipulation. So some of our predecessor work has looked into some kind of domain shift in a very small scale, or even like a real world domain shift that is pretty hard to actually replicate and uh, to reproduce. And, you know, so looking forward by drawing some inspiration from our uh, ancestor work, we are able to actually propose Colotium, the benchmark, which consists of 20 RL bench tasks. So these are really, you know, basic manipulation household tasks that you, you have to think about. For example, like wiping the table, you know, setting up the chessboard for you, or even to close the laptop. And what we do is that we take this task and we try to create 12 different axes of variations. So this variation includes lighting change, uh, includes you know size of the object being changed in the manipulation process, or even the object that's being manipulated, the receiving object size change, texture, background, positional change, language variations, a bunch of these variations. And we systematically try to design such a benchmark for evaluating you know, uh, some of these robotic transformers. And uh, above that, we also look into, can we actually create a totally extreme case whereby we have all the variations and that sort of really puts some of the robotics manipulation models to the test to see how well can they actually transfer uh, and adapt to some of these changes. And to be honest, a lot of these changes are what we expect to see in the real world because you know a policy that's trained in the lab that's deployed in your, in your own house will look slightly different from the training data that you actually have. So with that framework, the colloquium framework actually focus on first, we generate a fixed set of training data of that 20 tasks. And then we, we allow you to train your behavior cloning model on that fixed set of training tasks. And then we test it, test your model with the colloquium's variations. And then we use that to update the leaderboard. So it follows the out of distribution formulation for covariance shift. Basically, we try to keep the testing data completely different from the training data, and we evaluate this variation in a systematic manner. Uh, so one by one, we try to evaluate these variations. And this is just an outlook of our benchmark in terms of you know, the different kind of task that it has, and also in terms of the perturbations that it actually contains. And of course, this is simulator, so it's not really restricted to this number, where else you can actually scale it up further. And for trying to evaluate this benchmark, we actually focus on two lines of work. The first line of work that focus on training robotic uh, transformers using uh, pre-trained data from image, and then uh, tries to learn action space uh, by taking RGB image uh, input, such as like R3M, uh, which is a well-known robotic encoder, uh, or like MVP. And also we look into the 3D aspect of things whereby with recent works like Perceiver Actor, which learns from 3D voxel representation and tries to predict the next best action in, uh, uh, as part of its transformers output. And also with the more improved version of Perceiver Actor RVT. So we are establishing these four models as the evaluation 
for our benchmark to sort of get people started in trying to test out some of their robotic transformers. Of course, this data set or this benchmark is not really restricted to four of them. Uh, we are just sort of setting it as the initial stage for people to kickstart their uh, evaluation of generalization for their models. So here is the evaluation result. So some of the things that we really learned from such evaluation is that uh, we found that actually, which I'll talk a bit more later towards the end, which that we found that 2D-based models actually turns to uh, overfit significantly to the training data. And it's not that generalizable, especially when you're trying to uh, make changes to the environments of like the size and the objects uh, texture and even the, the lighting condition. Whereas for 3D-based models where they take in 3D uh, RGBD inputs, it tends to be able to be more robust to some of these changes. So here is the sort of like radiograph of the results across the 12 axis of variations. And as you can see, like certain model does perform significantly better compared to other models. And of course, like looking from a different side of the spectrum, let's look at the percentage of you know decrease when you try to apply some of these perturbations versus when you test it on the original uh the original distribution that the training data contains. And you can see that there is a significant drop for some of these 2D models. And the reason that actually you see some of the tasks actually failing is actually what we actually expect. So like what behavior cloning does is that it tries to remember the key, uh, the key points that, uh, that re represents in individual data points and tries to sort of memorize the key points. So if you scale down the object size, you'll basically go and reach for an object that was originally the same size in the training data. And that behavior sort of reflected a lot in terms of some of these 2D models. And for 3D-based models, it actually works much better because you are learning a representation in 3D, and then that is able to actually adapt uh, to actually be invariant to some kind of scaling effects. And also, it's more adaptive to you know, having extra distractor because there's, a, there's much more rich information in 3D. However, the exchange of the cost is that you're actually having a much more uh, compute in terms of you know, training such 3D models as compared to 2D-based uh, 2D models. And here are just some of the examples of you know, models' performance on our colloquium datasets. Uh, we show some of the successful cases and the failure cases. And if you dive deeper into the paper, we actually analyze in depth why some of these cases lead to failure, and that helps uh, people that is using our benchmark to better understand their robotics transformer before trying to scale up with a huge bunch uh, with a large amount of robotics data. And this is for the 2D based models. So of course we can see that there's a distinct difference with like, some of these 2D based models versus 3D. And of course we also did like ablation study because like all benchmark, you know, people can find ways to solve like cheat or like to hack the system. So we test that with actually training uh training and testing with no uh, perturbations. And then we train with no perturbations, but we test with all the perturbations and we did for training and testing with all the perturbations. And you realize that even if you train on the ground truth uh, changes in the environment, you are not able to actually hit the upper bound. So that upper bound is still uh, restricted by the, by the nature of the task itself. So that's something that we actually ensures that the quality of the benchmark is that even if you try to train with the training data or do some kind of pre-training with the original testing data, you might not be able to actually hit the uh, upper bound performance of the benchmark. And uh, as all robotics paper, we need to have real world experiment to actually show that this thing transfers not just between simulation and the real world. And for the simulation, what we're trying to reflect is that, you know, you can use this benchmark to evaluate your robotics transformers, and then we will do the real world evaluation for you uh, through some of the experiments that we designed. So for our real world, we actually evaluated on four identical tasks from the 20 tasks that's in the RL bench data set. And then we actually bring that to life into the real world. So the tasks include setting our chairs, sliding block to target, and you know, scooping a cube and even to insert like a plate. And to make our real world experiment reproducible, everything that you see in the real world are 3D printable. So you can actually 3D print all these object assets with different color and different texture, also along with different scale in terms of the objects that's used for manipulation. And here are just some examples of the rollouts when we try to apply these variations. So we have like a spotlight that tries to you know create lighting change, and then we have you know customized backgrounds, table, top textures, you know colors, and a bunch of these uh, 
uh, assets to help to create such variations in the real world for evaluation. So the, the question is that why would you want to evaluate in the real world? So the idea is that a lot of these robotics uh, robotics transformers, you can actually evaluate in simulation and that makes it much easier. But you also want to see whether does the real world align with the simulation? So you want to see whether does the real world result and the simulation tells you the same thing about how does your model get affected by some of these perturbations or variations? So with that, we actually look into the result. And for that, we train two Percival Atom models, both in sim and real, with the same on the same task, on the same training setup uh, details. And then we evaluate them accordingly and we realize that there is sort of this trend in terms of how across different variation factors, the model tends to perform. And if you draw a sort of like a R square value plot against the simulation and real world result, you actually can see that it's a strong correlation for at least se uh, seven out of the 12 uh, tasks that's out there and a re really strong correlation for three of these variations. So that sort of shows that now you can actually safely evaluate the mo your model uh, in simulation and expect to actually have a decent kind of replication in the real world where you try to test generalization for your, for your model in the real world. So that's something that we do and uh, is to help people to better use our benchmark to evaluate generalization for their models. So I think coming down to what I've mentioned, I think there is like a few takeaways and insights from our first work, which is that, you know, we observe that 3D based behavior cloning models demonstrate like superiority over 2D based methods in terms of overall task performance and robustness to these environmental perturbations. And among those 2D and 3D models, you know, what we thought that as roboticists, distractors, you know, color-related objects and uh, color-related uh, factors or light perturbations has the most significant impact on uh, task success, which is something that we didn't really expect. Whereas contrary, the perturbations on object size, which makes manipulation much harder because you are, in, you are implicitly affecting the way that the manipulation task works because now the object is shrinking down so the points that it tries to predict should also adapt to that. And chains tend to have a less impact on this uh, both setting. So that's something that we didn't uh, that sort of like flip our uh, our intuition that we have over over uh, over the years of like you know trying to study generalizations by pi uh, previous work. And we also sort of like try to establish a strong correlation between you know the failing task success. Uh, under the perturbations in simulation and those that is observed in the real world scenario for the exact same given task, although the real world and simulation, there is still bound to be some gap. Yeah, but we can see that it's a trend of decrease that's similar. And so with that, you know, now we can actually look at the first plot that I draw and you know, we can sort of like define some of these models and that, uh, and that will sort of help you make a better decision choice in terms of choosing the kind of robotic transformer that you want to scale up with a bunch of data you know, for trying to build the next foundational model in robotics. And that's by looking at it from the point of, are these, you know, robotic transformer able to be generalizable to, you know, some of these change? Because you don't really want to actually, you know, train a bunch of data on a transformer that will not be able to generalize. And of course, there's an, also another uh, axis that we have not yet looked into, which is the scaling effect. So maybe generalization comes when you try to scale it up dramatically. But uh, some of this model has already been pre-trained with a bunch of image data and is we still see some kind of lack of generalizations to some of these change. So that could be another thing to investigate in the future, yeah. And so moving on to the next axis of work is that we are looking to, okay, now we are able to make the decision on which model is best to actually help with, you know, generalizations for robotic manipulations. And now the next question is, what's the next bottom there, which is, can we be able to get enough data and I think getting enough data is not really about 100K, 200K trajectories, but are we able to have a way to allow humans to actually contribute in this data collection process? And that is something that I'll talk about in, our, in, our, in my next work, uh, which is AR2D2, training a robot without a robot. So I think uh, this work has been accepted to Cora uh, last year. And then uh, let me go into it. Yeah, so for this work, I think the focus is that, you know, Modern approach in terms of collecting robot data, especially for imitation learning, focus on a, a few methods, intuitive methods. So you have a user tries to tally up a robot, uh, either in simulation or in the real world, uh, to achieve a fixed 
uh, a fixed task and then you collect the trajectory and the robot state information and you use that data to train imitation learning policy. So there is a lot of methods to actually collect such data. So there's people using VR to collect in simulation. You can use graphic user interface to collect in the real world. Or uh, there's a really well-known work, Robot Turk, which uses mobile device to actually collect uh, remotely, having access to a real world robot, but teleoperating it from a remote distance uh, to collect some of the demonstrations or even having humans trying to do some kind of demonstrations to the robot in the exact same location with the physical robot next to it, or you know, having some kind of specialized device like a gripper, a, a gripper that is you can buy off like Amazon for like 100 bucks and mount a RGBD camera on it and tries to collect the same kind of uh, first person view kind of data as what a real robot gripper will do when it tries to manipulate the object, or even having some kind of visual based teleop systems that tracks your hand and tries to overlay that tracking onto a real robot. And uh, the most traditional way of like people trying to collect demonstration will be using kinesthetic teaching, whereby you hold onto the robot and tries to control the robot to collect such demonstrations, or even using mixed reality and what Google does with like their yeah, semi-autonomous, low-level control uh, teleop system, whereby they have some kind of autonomous policy running together with a bunch of people collecting robot data uh, remote, uh, uh, on, on, on site with a teleop system. So the question is, do we want to do some uh, any of these things? So the answer is no, because none of this approach can really try to scale up at scale. Because if you want to scale up data set at scale, and we have learned from uh, Vision and NLP is that you want users to be able to freely provide such data, not just researchers from uh, research institutes around the world, but every uh, every day's average user will be able to have access to device that's able to provide robot data and good robot data perhaps. So we do not want to have, you know, like teleop systems. We do not want to have fancy specialized hardware. Uh, and of course, teleop system is really tough because you have to train the person to try to manipulate the object. And we do not want to use the Eagle 4D data because the way that humans really perform an action or a task in your household that's not really equal to how a robot should perform that same task because robot has physical constraints that humans doesn't. So for us, it's easy to pick up object, but the robots need to have, you know, physical constraints requires it to be able to position at a specific location, run motion planning, and to have, do a bunch of other stuff before they actually can execute that task. And that's why when people are teleoperating, or teleoperating a robot, they have to have visual feedback of what the robot looks like as they operate. Uh, in, in the real world. And of course, we don't want to have a robot farm because like this is going to cost a lot of money and it's really hard to scale. So these are the things that we do not want to do. So we introduced AR2D2 to help to collect demonstrations. So what is AR2D2? So AR2D2 is basically a simple idea. You take a virtual robot using the URDF of a robot, you project it into an edge device in the form of an augmented reality, and then you project that augmented reality into the real world space. And because you're able to track human's hand, you can actually, in some degree, co control the robot by just manipulating it in the real world and the augmented reality robot will try to follow that same trajectory. And then by doing that, you're able to allow users to collect robot data with the ease of just using edge device such as iPhone and iPad. And the good thing about modern edge device is that it has a depth camera. In a sense, it has a LiDAR, which is able to capture the RGBD information of the scene. And then you take that data, you train a behavior cloning model, and then we deploy that into the real world. So this is the pipeline that uh, AR AR2D2 tries to propose. And how are we going to do that? So this is an example of the data collection demonstrations for training. So uh, I'm not sure uh, people, are, people are aware what's the object there. Basically, that is a Minecraft torch. Uh, it's supposed to be a torch. So you press, you press on the torch, the torch will light up. So it's a pretty out of distribution object. And we are able to collect, you know, uh, both the 3D and 2D data for training different kind of behavior cloning models. And then we try to deploy the policy that's trained into a real world space and we evaluate that. So the data set, uh, data set collection setup works in this way. So what you're trying to collect is that human's hand represents a six dwarf position where which matches the end factor of the robot and contains also like the state information of the gripper to be closed or open. And then every point you sort of move to is sort of a key point. 
And between key points, you generate a bunch of uh, data points, and then you use that to train a behavior cloning model like Perceiver Editor, which trains it in a supervised manner. And then what we try to show is that that training from the AR data can be extracted uh, and, you know, and re reproduced in the real world by the robot. So for example, the Minecraft torch that I mentioned, you have to press it at a very specific location and that information pro uh, propagate through the data into the training and is reflected during the evaluation on the real robot. So you actually press at the right location to actually execute the task. So what kind of data are we trying to collect? So we try to collect two kinds of data. The first kind is the 2D based data. For the 2D based data, we actually uh, implement some tricks in computer vision. So we do a hand post segmentation, we impaint away the hand, and then we do video alignment, and we are able to you know, get generated videos of the trajectory so that for 2D based models can directly learn off RGB, they can use that data to actually train their policy. And for 3D based models, we actually have the depth information. So the human hand represents the wave, the key points that the model tries to learn uh, in this supervised manner. And also this is a roar of what the 2D video looks like. It looks kind of eerie. It looks like a magic trick whereby a augmented reality robot is able to close a real world drawer. But basically this is the pipeline behind that process. And we are able to generate a bunch of 2D and 3D data in such a manner. So for our experiment, we try to evaluate on uh, some of the primitive actions that's uh, foundational in robotics. So like pushing, pressing, and picking objects. So uh, with that, we are able to actually focus on, so for this work, we focus a lot on customized objects because if you're able to train a general purpose model that is able to generalize across objects. So for example, if you can press a button, you should be able to press a mouse because it's able to generalize across objects then there's no point for such a work. So this work focuses a lot on personalized manipulation, whereby the objects or how you manipulate the object is hard to actually you know, cover in the training distribution that uh, large robotic transformers might be trained on. So we focus on that. And these are some of the objects that we actually use for manipulation. And also because that there is an inherent disparity between cameras from the iPad and versus the cameras that's used in the physical robot, we have to have some kind of rapid fine tuning. So we actually fine tune on like basic objects that has nothing to do with the, the object that was used for manipulation. And with that, uh, this is some of the rollouts. So this is uh, training purely on AR data. Uh, and this is the rollout for you know pressing the Minecraft torch, pressing buzzer, and also to press the mouse. So it's very specific locations for manipulation. And also we have like, you know, picking out objects. So picking out is even harder because you have to be able to create, formulate the correct grasp point to actually pick up the object, which is especially tricky for like picking out a chess piece, which is such a fine grain manipulation. And also we have like bigger actions such as pushing the objects towards a certain objective. Uh, and ultimately what we want to show from AR2D2 is that we are able to use such system to collect good robot data that is at the same level as someone that tries to collect robot data with a physical robot. Because I mean, if you can reach that same level, essentially you allow people to produce robot data with really low cost because you know a real robot costs about 20K to 30K. So with that, we actually run a bunch of uh, tests, uh, experiments. Uh, so we first of all, we compare with simulation. So we use simulation to actually collect demonstrations and then we actually train it and we do some kind of domain randomization to help to try to do sim to real transfer. And that shows that it's pretty bad in terms of sim to real transfer. So we actually look into real world, whereby we actually use VR interface to actually collect uh, demonstrations in the real world. Uh, but we don't, we collect the same set of action, but not on those personalized objects. So we collect on objects that are slightly similar. Uh, and we see whether will the model be able to generalize uh, to the new objects that's personalized during test time. And we found that actually it doesn't really do well uh, based on the performance. And to test the ultimate one, which we use the real world robot to collect demonstrations on the personalized object that's used in the test time. And then we train a model on that. And we see that this is the performance, the upper bound limit of what you can do with a real robot to collect demonstrations. And then we use AR2D2 to actually collect a bunch of AR de demonstrations and we compare the performance and from the performance, we can see that actually our, mod, uh, our system actually able to collect quality robot data that will lead to training policies that's performing on par 
with someone that used a real robot to collect on the same set of real world objects. And of course, we've done a bunch of ablation study to see how much of uh, you know, this uh, uh, fine tuning, rapid fine tuning is needed. And we find that 10 minutes of wall clock fine tuning is actually enough for actually uh, to, to transfer the, the, the training from the AR data into the real world. And of course, we also try to train 2D demonstration data and do like real world zero shot deployment on some of these 2D based model that I mentioned in the previous work. Yeah. And uh, here is just an example of more complex tasks that's trained with uh, AR, AR data. So complexity in this context refers to the amount of key points that you have to memorize as he trains these behavior cloning models. So with the AR data, it definitely works much better. And because we collect AR data from different environments, so inherently, and you're training 3D-based models, so it's able to generalize to really different scenes. So between scenes, it actually looks pretty different to our own eyes, yeah. And of course, we need to understand what some of the limitations in such work. So one of the limitations of collecting robot data without a physical robot is that you're going to be lacking in terms of the understanding of object physical attributes. Because when you are using a real robot to collect, the way that the robot interacts with the real world, the kind of friction, contact force, the amount of pressure it applies, all these things is sort of reflected in the distribution of the data. Whereas when you're trying to use our system, that's something that is hard to reflect because human hand operates pretty differently. So with that, uh, when you try to when you try to run some ablation study, you realize that all you need to do is just to change the texture of the cloth, and you realize that model that's collected with AR demonstrations will not work to change this new texture with like different contact force for manipulation. Yeah, so the next question and the last question we want to ask is that, okay, now we have this system, but is it really more intuitive for the user because we want people to be able to use it, uh, users like you and me, not just robotics. So we actually conducted a small user study. We use all the existing, uh, most of the existing uh, or conventional methods to collect robot demonstrations in the real world and also in simulation compared with our method in AR. And we find that uh, in terms of, you know, the average time taken to collect per demonstration, we are, com we are comparable to using kinesthetic teaching, which means that you have access to a physical robot and you can just control it by uh, pulling the robot towards the target. And in terms of the time taken, we are also uh, much fa uh, faster as compared to kinesthetic teaching. And for more subjective measure, we want to know whether is people satisfied with our method. Uh, with our SS SUS score, we actually see that people prefer AR2D2 much higher than most of the method and comes, you know, second run up to, kin uh, then kinesthetic teaching comes second run up to AR2D2. And that is something that's really, uh, you know, rewarding to hear because the whole idea of AR2D2 is to be able to help with crowdsourcing robot data in the, in the long run. So why should we scale our robot demonstrations? You know, coming back to that question that we have in the start, because we sort of seeing an emergence in language uh, when you try to scale up uh, you know, the number of uh, texts that you have in terms of your training data or training some of your foundational model uh, uh, LLMs. And we also seen some kind of emergence in vision when you try to, you know, increase your training data for training like uh, models like SAM. And so the question is, what is emergence in robotics when you try to scale out this data? So I don't really have an answer for that, but maybe the emergence, uh, I can offer some of my own take on that. And maybe some of this emergence can come in a very interesting way. Uh, that we didn't expect. So we don't really expect you to be able to, you know, create new tasks, for example, but we're able to expect you to be able to generalize. But some of the other things that we sort of miss out is that maybe some potential signs of emergence in robotics looks like this. So if you train a model, uh, a standard robotic transformer, and you try to visualize the encoder cross attention for a task that's a condition of language, such as uh, turn the left tab, you realize that if you visualize that certain parts of that voxel sort of light up. And interestingly, the part that is, uh, that is supposed to turn will light up, of course. But if you look carefully, this side of the, the, the faucet also light up. And the reason is because to tell which is left and right, this is the part that actually tells in the simulation, at least for humans. Uh, and if you look at that from a more zoom out perspective, 
maybe by training on just robot data, you'll be able to give you some kind of representation that can help in computer vision. For example, like segmentation, tracking, you know, detection, and all you need to do is just to train on a bunch of robotics data. So the summary of this uh, two work that I have right now is that, you know, we look at the ease of scaling with AR2D2, and we also look at how generalizable some of these robotic transformer models are, and how, why should we continuously benchmark some of these robotic transformer models? So the next question that, you know, to move into 3D as I've been preaching here is that we should look into skill diversification. So of course we want to teach our robots skills and not actions. So actions such as pick and place, you know, there's a bunch of these kind of things with like recent work, but we want to teach robot skills. So skills such as the ability to cut, the ability to toss, to fold clothes, you know, to even play piano or even to make dumplings for those people that love dumplings. Yeah, so this is what we focus on. And learning skill, the only the best way to sort of learn skill will be from the action-centric representation. And how can we really diversify that? We should, you know, scale it and scale and scale with more data. But of course, uh, as the whole talk tries to surround, we should scale model the right way. And then, uh, so I, so this is some personal thoughts. So I believe that you know we should have a base model of really good skill, foundational skill that has already been trained uh, on a robotic transformer. And then we sort of fine tune that with a bunch of uh, data that's generated by foundational models uh, that actually can you know leverage foundation model to self generate the demonstrations such as Vox Poser and authority. And then we further fine tune that on you know methods to actually collect personalized data because you want to be able to have a robot to perform tasks in your house and your house might be pretty different from my house. So I think the whole talks of uh, wrap around this idea that you know maybe it's about time for robotics to give vision and language some kind of representation for learning and hopefully you know by making the right decision of scanning and understanding how to actually scale up properly that will actually help us to you know better reach the day we have like a real foundation model in robotics yeah so this is a uh, huge thanks to my collaborator and advisors and uh, yeah feel free to reach out to me via emails yeah thank you any, I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Jafei. Yeah. I 